Hello, welcome to Rational Investing. My name is Cameron Stewart, CFA. Thank you very much for watching the channel, all the comments and subscribers. I greatly appreciate it. This week up, we're going to do a special pivot. We're not going to do a big name company. We're going to do a very small company, but a company that uh, Michael Burry himself has put a lot of cash into. It's, in fact, it's, it's only holding right now. Who is Michael Burry? He is the famed hedge fund investor played by Christian Bale in the movie The Big Short. Uh, let's put up uh, Michael Burry's photo here for you so you can see the man himself. And of course, Christian Bale, his uh, much better looking counterpart, played the role of uh, Michael Murray uh, in the movie The Big Short, uh, which focused on the downturn of the economic collapse in 2008. Uh, fast forward, Michael Murray has been active on Twitter. Every now and then he nuke, nukes his Twitter account, but I de definitely suggest that you follow him. He's got a lot of very interesting content. He's been right about it. the housing market. He's been right about recent inflation. He's picked some interesting stocks. GameStop was one he was in that skyrocketed. This is now his only holding. He's nuked everything else. Uh, so let's take a look at why he holds this business. GEO Group owns prisons of all things. Uh, but there is some surprising cash flow here that you could possibly make 30% cash flow yield. That's a yield. Let's check out how much free cash this thing makes and if we think it's actually worth the investment. Ready? Let's get to work. All right, now before we get started, we're going to obviously click through the 10K. I want you to read the 10Ks very carefully, right? There's, this company has a lot of history. It's been public for a long time. Go through and read every single 10K you can to judge the investment before you do it. We're going to click through the 10 years of financial data quick, pretty quickly, but as always, review the 10K. Now, the way we look at stocks is a very simplistic way. We look at five key attributes. We want to see, number one, top line revenue growth. Got to have it. Number two, EBITDA. Earnings level, enterprise level earnings must be growing. Number three, strong free cash flow. Kind of self-evident with this channel. Number four, low debt. Less than three times debt to EBITDA. And number five, a well-priced stock. What is a well-priced stock? A well-priced stock is simply a stock with a conservative growth forecast will beat the market. That's it. We have no idea what the future is going to look like, so we try to give very conservative outlooks going forward. And if in that instance we think that's a highly likely of outperforming the market, that is a stock that warrants further review. It doesn't mean you buy it. It doesn't mean you, you put your money in it, but it means that goes to the top of the pile and you start continuing reading until you can't uh, kick the until you can't disprove the thesis. If you can't get rid of the idea that you're going to make that kind of money, then invest. But um, investing is a subtractive game, not an additive. You start with the entire universe of everything, and you slowly remove all the other stocks until you're left with just a key 20 to 30 stocks that you want to own for a long, long time. That's how you do it. All right, let's dive right into the numbers here. Um, let's take a look at the revenue uh, total over the years for the CEO group, uh, excuse me, the GEO group. We're, quick highlight on them, by the way. So what do they do again? They they build, own, and operate owned and leased prison or jails, correction facilities. Um, they also do um, electronic monitoring of, of, um, of uh, released individuals, rehabilitation centers. That's their, that's their niche. They operate them under long-term contract, mostly with the government, mostly in the United States, but some in, in, in Australia and the UK. Uh, these are long-term government contracts uh, based on a kind of per-occupancy rate that they, that they run at. They have 103 facilities in total with 83,000 beds. Um, they have run at about an 88% uh, occupancy rate, almost 90%. So that's about 70,000 inmates that they're in charge of with 18,000 employees. Now, there's a caveat here. When you look historically in these financials or you're doing screening filters, this company was a REIT, Real Estate Investment Trust. And as such, they were paying out 90% of their free cash flow, of their income, as a dividend distribution. Well, in, two, in December of 2021, so very recently, they converted from a REIT into a traditional C-Corp where they pay income tax. And in that transition, uh, they had to expense a lot of income tax that was owed uh, for the transition to have to write the balance sheet and obviously legal cost to convert. And that hurt the earnings in 2021, and we'll see that. But I think when we look at the underlying cash flow, the business itself hasn't changed. There's a lot of debt here as a result of having to kick out 90% of their income every year. They, they leverage themselves when they were a REIT. 
uh, by the way, caveat, a lot of REITs and a lot of master limited partnerships, MLP, those two structures that are required to kick out a lot of their cash flow every year, that prevents them from having a good cash balance. Uh, if you have to distribute 90% of your income every single year, a down year means there's not a whole lot of reserve there to protect on a down year. As a result, those businesses tend to be very highly leveraged. They use debt to, uh, to make that dividend payment every year and to keep a cash balance. So always be careful when you're looking at REITs and at, um, at Master Limit Partnerships, MLPs, for how much debt they carry. But that's a side note. These guys have converted from an MLP into, excuse me, a, a REIT into a C Corp. They're now C Corp paying taxes every year like all the other companies. So let's take a, a look at this business. So, sorry, I got a little long-winded there. Bear with me. So what have they been doing? Revenue, revenue, top line revenue growth. This is fiscal year in December. These are in millions of dollars. So that's $1.5 billion in 2013. It grew to 1.7, 1.8, 2.1, 2.2, 3.3, 2.4, dropped here from the COVID, dropped again for the conversion of the C of the C Corp. So a little bit of the hiccups the last couple of years. But if I look at it in its totality, it's growing at a 5% CAGR. That's consolidated annual annualized growth rate. So over the long term, they have been expanding their portfolio of correction facilities. Those correction facilities are full because we keep putting people in prison, uh, okay, uh, and no comment there. And so, so that is that is their customer base. They're contracted with the government. There are very few other places these people can go. I like that sticky revenue, uh, and it continues to grow. Very very nice earnings. EBITDA earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. One caveat here: earnings before interest. Interest rates are rising. This company is heavily leveraged. So this figure is not going to include the increase in interest rate applied to the debt outstanding. That's going to come through when we look at free cash flow. This is just a relative me measure of earnings, putting debt aside. How is the underlying business performing um, with, their, with their financing structure, their leverage system aside? And much like revenue, EBITDA has been growing at a fairly constant margin, right? Revenue is growing at 5%, earnings are growing at 6%. That means margins are growing slightly, but essentially the same. That's $280 million of EBITDA, uh, 333, 331, 342, 381. I mean, it, it side maybe a blip here. It's been growing nicely. In fact, when I look at their six months of 2022, right, this video is as of August, they've released March and June quarters. They're on pace for 500 million of EBITDA, so a, a banner year for them. Uh, and so it's really interesting when we look at this stock. Let's keep, go let's keep going. So we've checked the box, revenue and EBITDA is growing. Let's figure out enterprise value, right? Remember, remember what is enterprise value? Enterprise value is the entire business, not just the stock, not what trades in the stock market, which is only the market cap of the business. It, we also need to include the debt that's in this business. And together is the enterprise value. So let's take a look at this. Leverage. I'm looking at short-term and long-term debt. I'm also looking at capitalized leases. So this includes the leases they pay for uh, the renting of some of these facilities. And uh, we like to see this number less than three times. Uh, let's keep going, see what's going on. So $1.5, $1.6 billion of debt in 2013, that has grown to $3 billion in 2021, a doubling of the leverage ratio of debt over this period of time. Now, there was an accounting change, I want to caveat in 2019 here, that forced public companies to put onto their balance sheet the um, the, the rent rental agreements to capitalize them as debt. So there's an, an artificial lift there from accounting change, but overall, this business is, is leveraging itself more and more as it was a REIT to make that 90% payout and still have the cushion that businesses need to operate for fluctuations of, of, of business. So you can see that the, the earnings have grown at 6%. Not quite doubling, right? Doubling would be actually this year, 500 million to 2.8 to about five. Uh, but debt has doubled from 1.5 to three. So I think the debt's growing slightly faster than earnings. I would expect the leverage ratio here to be growing a little bit. We'll take a look at that in a second. 
Cash itself, now cash flow has been fairly excess, excess cash, right? So this isn't cash on the balance sheet. This is cash that's, excuse me, this isn't cash in the cash line on the balance sheet of the 10K. This is generally either an excess of what I determine arbitrarily to be a normalized level of cash. Anything above that we would cap um, characterize as excess cash. Or some companies actually have a short-term investment line that I use for excess cash. And when I look at this business, they were paying their, their dividends here and they were, um, they were a REIT. They convert into a REIT and they shut down the dividends, scale the dividend way, way back. And what's happening is the cash that they generate normally is no longer being distributed to the, share, to the shareholders and it's piling up on the balance sheet. That is a very, very nice, if, if debt hasn't changed, that's a very nice check that the business itself can generate cash because cash on the balance sheet at the end of a fiscal year can be audited by third parties. They pick up the phone, you know, if, if PwC is these guys auditors, PricewaterhouseCoopers pick up the phone, hey JP Morgan, how much cash did uh, the GEO group have at the end of the fiscal year? JP Morgan will say, well, they had $432 billion. Okay, thank you very much. Check that box. Like it's been verified, which I like that a lot, which is different from the income statement, different from cash flow statement, which can be kind of moved around by management a little bit, but a verified number such as cash on a balance sheet is measured at a point in time and can be verified by third party. I really, really like that. So, so this is me saying, hey, I think they have a lot of excess cash. And what I like here is that the business continues to run. They slow the dividend down, the dividend payment, and that cash is stockpiling up. Then we're going to go to market cap. Market cap is shares outstanding times average price. I use fully diluted shares on the income statement. It's kind of a weighted average for the year times the average share price uh, in this case in December. And what do you see? $2.3 billion market cap to a market cap of $900 million. That's that's crazy. I, we, we, we don't see drops, certainly in this landscape. Uh, well, I guess more recently we've seen a lot of drops, but this is a big material drop of $2.3 billion of market cap down to less than a billion dollars. Uh, it's even less than that now. If I add the debt and market cap, less the excess cash, I get enterprise value. That's what we care about. That's the entire business. So what is this entire business's value? Well, $3.8 billion of total value to 3.5. So a slight drop in enterprise value, but earnings have grown, right? Earnings have almost doubled during this time. In fact, it will double when they finally print 2022 number at 500 million. It's going to double. But here the enterprise value itself is, is actually down. So this is the interesting part where we start finding true value that, that I think uh, we still have to do cash flow, obviously. But right now, let's take a look at a couple more metrics. Um, to round out this discussion, let's look at a relative value metric that we use EBITDA against, uh, excuse me, enterprise value divided by EBITDA. This is a relative value. It's like, here's the entire value of the business, and then here's the annual earnings expressed as an EBITDA number. Uh, how many years of operations does the business need to generate to pay for itself? It's just a relative value measure, and it allows you to compare one business to another fairly quickly by talking about the multiple of earnings. You can look at earnings per share, or excuse me, price per, price per share, PE ratio. This is just another ratio that's a little higher up on the scale that lets me look at a relative value for a business. And what I see here is a business that when it was a REIT was trading in solid double digit territory. This is probably 13 times on average. And then it's come down to 8.3, it's now seven times, an absolute um, uh, steal in my opinion, if, if these numbers hold, um, in terms of a relative value, it's an all time low. Now, here's the trick. This is why it's so cheap, or you gotta ask yourself, well, why is something so cheap? What am I missing? How, how am I this lucky? Well, it's fully levered. In fact, it's more than fully levered. We say three times debt to EBITDA is a ratio to help protect us as equity owners against the threat of bankruptcy, <clears throat> right? Because they call it the capital stack is the, is, the, is the balance sheet, the capital that the business has raised over time. And any debt is always in front of us common stock holders. We are the bottom of the barrel. We get everything left after uh, if, if, if a bankruptcy, God forbid, was, was, was to happen, 
a judge would order all the assets to pay down. First payroll for any employees that haven't got paid. Then you get vendors. Vendors get their cash for supplies and so forth. Then the debt holders get paid. And finally, if there's anything left, generally there's not the equity owners get something. And for these guys, that's why we want less than three times to make sure there's always enough to kind of make that payment. Um, here they're sitting at six times debt to EBITDA and that's twice our level. So this is the risk for us. We wanna see them pay this down. And in fact, that's their plan. I'll go through it in a little bit, but right now this would not qualify for us because it's twice the level that we wanna see. All right, let's, let's go to cash flow. All right, before we dive into cash flow, I do want to remind you, I do teach a course. The course is on cashflowinvestingpro.com. Check that website out where I teach you how to be a financial analyst and do this yourself. All right, let's check out cash flow from operation. This is where the rubber meets the road. The cash flow is the cash money that is made by running the business. It's different from the income statement, which is a, a, an accounting profit. We want to figure out how much jack do they actually make? And so we, the first thing we pick up is cash flow from operations, the first third of the balance sheet. Um, I've got the first third, the middle third, the final third, and the total balance, uh, cash flow, I said balance sheet, the cash flow statement. That's what we want. This is cash flow from operations, $192 million of pure cash that they made in 2013. 200, 142, negative, 381, so on and so forth to 344. Now I've adjusted these numbers here. There's a little bit of, um, uh, there was a little bit of cash payment. I think it was an AR buy down uh, that happened here and here. And I backed those out because they were um, uh, uh, not typical and it was a one-time deal. So I've normalized and it looks like the last three years when earnings and when revenue and earnings were kind of declining a little bit over COVID and kind of flat here, it looks like cash flow itself is relatively flat. But in general, this is growing over time at an 8% annualized CAGR, which is consistent, by the way, sorry, which is consistent with our EBITDA growth rate. Good job, accounting team. Way to expense what's actually going on in the business with the cash flow statement. I like to see them both moving in the same direction. Kudos, guys. Thanks Thanks for being the honest, honest, hardworking people you are. CapEx. CapEx is how to maintain these facilities, right? I said that they have 103 facilities. That's a lot. They are maintaining beds for 83,000 people. They absolutely have to put money back in this business to paint the facilities, fix any rust in the bars, I, I don't know, put new glass in, uh, mow the lawn, I mean, all that, well, it's not CapEx, but, but all of that stuff to maintain the infrastructure they have, which produces this cash flow, they must put money back in. So what happens? <clears throat> it looks to me like this is coming down. The last couple years here, they're bringing this down because they're telling investors that they wanna pay down debt. And what do you wanna do when you pay down debt? Well, you start cutting back on on, on everywhere, uh, on, on SG&A, on payroll, on CapEx, it's a great way to save, save money. So they're gonna take all that cash that they're saving and they're gonna buy down debt, which we're gonna go through in a little bit. But in general, I'm seeing a number that's north of $100 million. These, these years aside, these are acquisitions, by the way, that's why they're so big. They went and acquired new um, facilities. But it, those aside, I'm seeing about $100, $120 million a year as an ongoing, cap X number they should have. That got down to 70 million, might even come down lower as they try to generate cash to pay down debt. All right, let's take a look at debt, mostly borrowing here. The, these numbers are mostly positive. You'll see when they were a REIT, they were borrowing to make the payment because that is like a, a relentless taskmaster. If you have to pay out 90% of your income to your investors, there is very little room to make any mistakes or to make any, frankly, long-term investments. And so you have to borrow a lot of money, and that's borrowing. And this is gonna turn negative going forward as they buy down the debt to normalize the business from being a REIT into being a C-Corp. So I add these three up, right? This is the middle, the top third, middle third, and bottom third of the cash flow statement. I'm gonna do the free cash flow sh per share. This is how much free cash flow money this company makes on an annual basis, and what's the, it is what the stock value is truly about. And this is $327 million. Now, shares outstanding, how do you divide that among the people who own the business? Well, shares outstanding have been growing. We would like to see this shrink, 
but as they REIT, right, as they are paying out 90% of their income, there is not a lot of money to buy back stocks, so they haven't historically. Now, I will say that recently, as the stock market has, as the stock price has declined over the last two years, they have been buying back stock in here. They have not purchased any stock in this recent year with the stock market being absolutely obliterating the stock. I'm curious to know why the insiders, the company itself is not buying stock if the stock price is at $7 a share. Uh, they have been, they, they bought it before and it was $19 a share. They bought it before and it was $26 a share. Why are they balking at $7? I don't understand that. I also looked at the insiders here. The insiders are not buying. They haven't bought since uh, 2021. So insiders aren't buying. Companies not buying, doing a back, stock, stock buyback. Uh, but Michael Burry's diving in here. So it's, it's kind of interesting. We'll, we'll get to why in a second. Uh, but I think in, in terms of the stock buyback, uh, the company is prioritizing all their cash flow to debt. So the, I think that's the honest answer that why they're not engaging in buybacks. They need to pay down their debt. So shares that's done great. When I divide free cash flow by share, I get free cash flow per share. We're looking at $2 There's $2.70. Now I will caution you <clears throat> that two seventy dollars is artificially low because they're not normalizing their CapEx. I'm going to go with this line. 2019 has roughly the same free cash flow, $338 million versus 344. That's close enough. And a much more normalized capex, 117 million, not the 70. So when I look over, oh, also, and, and debt is almost zero. So I think that their normalized cash flow is about the 215 shares outstanding, and I'm looking at about a dollar 80 a share in free cash flow. Now this stock is trading currently at seven dollars a share, assuming no debt pay down. That yield is what is the seven dollars. That's a 25% free cash flow yield at the current price. Now, you're not going to get all of that today. Right? They have to pay down debt. We're going to cover that in a second. But if they pay down the debt and the business grows or doesn't deteriorate, that cash flow, once the debt is normalized, goes back to the equity holders and boop, the, stop, the cash flow yield to you for waiting should go up and should normalize to about 25% annual indefinitely forever. I mean, people are doing 30 years. You're going to be paying the GEO group 30 years to house the person. What are you going to do? Go build a new prison? That's that's a billion dollars of CapEx right there. Might as well just keep paying them to keep housing their inmates. If, they're, if the government can use to pay GEO and they keep their margins the same, you bought the stock at six bucks, you should get the free cash flow assuming debt's normalized. And, uh, and that should pay you 25% cash flow forever. That's, I mean, what am I missing here? Let's, let's, let's keep going, let's keep going, and, and we'll figure out what we're missing. Okay, debt pay down, all right? So we have established that they have six times debt to EBITDA, and they gotta bring that down. Now, the company has said that they're gonna bring down leverage ratio. Well, I'll back up. $3 billion is the total debt they have as of the last uh, December's uh, annual report, $3 billion. They have stated that their leverage ratio wants to be four times leverage, and they're currently growing, right? I said that the, the, the forecast is for $500 million of EBITDA. If you grow that for a couple more years, by the time they pay down the debt over a couple years and EBITDA grows a bit, we can kind of say that in 2024-ish, EBITDA is going to be some number where four times that number is the total debt that they should have. That's this. If I look at the maximum amount of debt they should have, they should be $2.1 billion. Now, uh, they're targeting three to four range. My debt includes their rent expense. I don't, excuse me, the, the rent leases. They don't consider that as true debt. We look at that as debt. So I think we're in this, they're in the three range. I'm saying four just because I'm including the rent is debt. So I, I don't know why I said that, but just there's a little bit of difference here, but I think we're, we're talking the same relative number. They should be targeting a total debt of about $2 billion. Now, that's a pay down of a little math here, quick math. Yep, a billion dollars. So they have to pay down a billion dollars of debt over a number of years. And they have said that they're going to earmark $225 million annually to make the payment. Well, if I have to pay down a billion dollars and I'm putting out 225, that's gonna be slightly over four years, or it's 2021, that's 2024 
uh, through the 2024 year. So 2025, we should expect an extra $225 million of free cash flow to hit the equity owners at that time. You just got to wait for it. If I take the $225 million and I divide it by the shares that's saying, that's $1.86 per share. Now, I said earlier that their share here was $1.80. So they're going to use almost all of the free cash flow to pay down debt over the next several years, which means the dividend for this business is going to be almost zero going forward. Let's focus on the forecast and figure out what we want to pay for this business. All right, to forecast, we're going to start with EBITDA, our relative value measure. I said that the if I look at the first six months of their business, it's been robust. Uh, they're forecasting good, strong business for the next for the back half of the year with a target number of about 500 million of EBITDA. That's a 15% year-over-year growth in this business. Again, earnings were down the last couple years because of the transition. Uh, they also sold the facility, it's a little down, but, but it looks like it's coming back based on the first uh, um, six months. So what I do is I spike this to kind of give me a target for where I think they're going to be. But then they're not going to grow every year at that rate. This is a prison. It's not a software company. So I'm basically saying, hey, look, I'll give them 3% to be conservative. Over the long term, what do we say? Their, their EBITDA was 6%. Well, I'm spiking at 15. Oops, don't want to show you that. I'm spiking at 15%. And so instead of giving six on top of that, I'm gonna bring it down, say 3% long-term, and I will give it a 12, per, 12 times market multiple, which is somewhat close to what they have um, it received in the past. 12 point, if I can get this in the screen, 12.3 historically. Again, that's, that's having this really low number bring it down. I think if you look in this range, it's a little north of 12, but to be conservative, I'll give it 12. Okay, so now we've got a we've got an EBITDA target <clears throat> out long term of six hundred and fifty million dollars. I'm applying a twelve times leverage ratio to that. That's giving me an enterprise value of seven point seven billion dollars. I less some debt, which is three billion. Add some cash, which is four hundred million, and I get a five billion dollar enterprise value. I divide that by the shares, and it would be forty two dollars and sixty five cents out ten years for a price target based on a relative value metric, enterprise value to EBITDA. Let's take a look at free cash flow. Now, free cash flow. Free cash flow, obviously, we need to deal with the debt pay down. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking that $1.80 figure that we saw in 2019, and I'm growing it by 15% because this year is going to be bigger than it was in 2019, uh, so they're going to grow. But I have to pay the $1.86, that $225 billion of debt payment. So that means that my free cash flow <clears throat> is only 21 cents. And it's going to be 21 cents for several years until in 2025, having normalized the debt, I get that cash back. So in 2025, I'm thinking you're going to be at about $2 of free cash flow. And that $2 should grow at the 3% along with EBITDA, if I apply an 8% yield to that, which is still a conservative yield, I get a $31 price target out 10 years. All right, now we got two price targets. Let's take a look at what the stock is trading for currently. All right, here we are. I can buy as much stock in this company currently as I want at $7.60 a share. Uh, the company did stock buybacks on its own at, I think, um, $16, $25 and $16. They've stopped. Michael Burry's in. He bought last quarter, so he's someplace around the, the $8 mark. Um, it seems to be stabilizing a little bit. I've got two relative value measures, excuse me, I have two valuation measures, a free cash flow method, right, where we, we looked at long-term having paid down the debt and that cash is then released back to the equity owners at an 8% yield, I get a $31 price target. EBITDA enterprise value multiple, $42. This does not include the EBITDA, right, excludes interest. So if interest rates rise and they're not able to bring the debt down, uh, they're gonna have to pay more in interest. So this number here does not affect that. This number here has expensed interest expense in it. Then maybe that's why the valuation is slightly lower. 
Current enterprise value, uh, $3.5 billion. That's taking the $7 and change times, um, times shares outstanding plus debt, less cash. Our forward EBITDA number, we think they're going to make $500 million next year. That means it's trading at seven times forward enterprise value EBITDA. That is essentially an all-time low for this company. It, it had traded for twice that only six years ago. And if I look at a forward cash flow year, 2025, this is not something you're going to find in a screening tool that's out there in the market. This is doing hard research, reading, and making an opinion, which, yes, it's slow. And yeah, you can't just quickly screen something and come up with the investment of a lifetime. Not that this is, but it takes work. That's what I'm trying to say. But I think long term, if you're willing to wait, there's a lot of cash on the table here for people who want to put money away and don't want to, don't want to look at it for five years. Uh, so this is very, very interesting. Now, what do I do? What happens if I drop this into an IRR calculation? How much do we think we can make by making the investment? Well, here we go. I'm in the stock at $7.60. I get this stream of pro rata ownership. This is not a dividend. This is your relative, va relative ownership of the cash flow that's generated in this business. They can either buy back stock with it. They can, they can, uh, they're already paying down there. They can buy back stock. They can pay a dividend or they can make acquisitions with this money. 2025, it flips. The cash flow spikes because they paid down their debt. And then the, the cash flow boosts value and I get capital appreciation from $7.60 to, to $36 a share. That gives me <clears throat> an IRR of 30%. And that is an almost all-time high here at this channel of a relatively conservative stock. It's not a growth stock. It's a prison company with contracted revenue from governments to house individuals and it could possibly yield 30% return. That is an incredible stock. Let's take a look at um, this number here. This is our little distribution curve. We're here with the assumptions that I just outlined. If the stock goes up, I'm still a buyer. I still think it's interesting. If the stock comes down, uh, I think um, I think there's a uh, this even even better. Let's take a look. Let's review our five key attributes. Okay. So number one, top line revenue growth. Yes, I'm going to check the box. Number two, earnings growth. EBITDA is growing. I'll check the box. Yes. Number three, strong free cash flow. Yes, it generates strong free cash flow with the debt aside. I'll check the box. Number four, low debt. It is not currently low debt. However, the price is very low. And I think that compensates you for the fact that it is over levered and they will be paying down debt. I'm willing to check the box because they're making it a priority to pay down the debt. And they've stated that their debt target range is very close to our target range. Number five, a well-priced stock. Yes, I think the conversion from a REIT into a C-Corp plus the debt payment, which is sucking cash from equity owners and creating the value of the stock has bottomed and given us a very risk adjusted, attractive company. The stock has been absolutely um, destroyed in the stock market. And I think while the cash flow is going to be prioritized for the next multiple years to pay down debt, <clears throat> if you are an investor and not a stock trader, and you want to put some cash away in a company that should be around for 30 years and could potentially give you a 25% free cash flow yield out several years from now, I think this is a very attractive opportunity to take a look at a strong stock that over time should perform for you and give you something close to this, right? There's no guarantees in anything. Obviously, no one knows what the future's like, but I find this very attractive. So this is my thesis. Uh, apparently, it's Michael Burry's thesis because he's in the stock. Let me know what you think. Throw a comment down below. Am I missing something here? Why is this stock trading like this? And what am I missing? Also, throw me a comment. Let me know what other stocks you'd like to uh, like for me to review. I'm happy to review them. Now, a shameless plug. If you want to learn how to do this, uh, go to cashflowinvestingpro.com. There's a link down below. I give you this uh, Excel sheet in a course that I teach on how to, how to read cash flow. I, we go through Apple. I give you 10 10 Ks, and we look at 10 years of Apple financial performance. We fill out revenue, uh, earnings, cash flow, uh, total debt. We do a share. Apple split their shares multiple times. I show you how to reverse out that. Go get market data to fill in 10 year history, regardless of what happens with the stock splits. So I teach you how to be a fundamental analyst, and I highly recommend you do the course because it'll teach you what you need to know for the rest of your life. And you can build 
forecasts for every stock that you own and watch them over time. And over time, you'll get better and better and better at forecasting. Um, I also have a club, Cash Flow Club, which is in the upper left-hand corner of my website. You can also get a free one-pager on the link down below where I kick out 10, 12, 15 stocks, far more than I can on the YouTube channel. But I give you everything you need to know. So 10 years of financial information. I've got the summarized five key attributes off to the left-hand side. I forecast cash flow. I forecast EBITDA. I give you the IRR and a write-up on the company. We're doing lots of stocks. We've got an analyst that we're hired. We're growing. Join the club. It's a great time. We're going to cover a lot more stocks in this next, uh, the next over the next year. And I really hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much for watching the video. Uh, please share me in social media. I appreciate the um, the shout outs. And I'll see you next week. Um, up is going to pop a couple new videos and some other uh, value stocks that I've looked at. Give those a click. Really appreciate it. And uh, see you next week. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.